Where in the world is tea cultivated? China, India and Kenya are the largest producing country, but hard to believe even in the United States tea is cultivated. And I'm going to visiting a tea plantation right now. Hi guys, this is Gabriele from Nano Shan, where we share the pleasure of drinking and discovering genuine farm tea. If you're also looking to expand your tea knowledge and brewing skills, make sure to click on the subscribe button and don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoy what you're watching. Today I am outdoor and I am visiting the Great Mississippi Tea Company. I am in uh, Southern Mississippi in the United States pretty much uh, uh, halfway between uh, Jackson and uh, New Orleans and I'm waiting for one of the owner I assume of the great uh, Mississippi tea company I have an appointment with him to visit their tea garden actually when I arrived here I was expecting to find uh, offices and you know a parking lot and so on but actually there is nothing of all these there is nobody around it is just uh, a road on the countryside with a few cars coming and going and uh, yeah and there are some uh, tea trees here that is really really exciting to see because uh, I wasn't expecting this year to be able to see some tea plantation again you know with Covid around I am not able to travel to China of course and I'm really missing tea, tea plantation and it's quite exciting for, for me to be here I'm here with Timmy and now the tour gets started. All Let's right. go. So we started eight years ago. Um, so in the beginning, all of this here was a uh, cattle land right here. Um, originally there was 296 acres. Um, so we didn't know what we were going to do with this. We knew we were about to inherit it um, and we needed to figure something out. We also have a timber farm down in Walthall County, which is about an hour away from here and we didn't want to do timber here. We also didn't want to continue to do cattle and we didn't want to do road crops. So uh, Jason, who was the other person that owns the farm, um, decided we, he needed a little vacation. We owned a car lot in town during that time. And so he went and stayed in Savannah, Georgia and he called me and said, I found this tea bag in my hotel and I want to go see it. It's for Charleston Tea Plantation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you yeah. So we said, okay, well, this is like Tuesday. I'm like, well, the weekend is coming up. You know, I'll get a plane ticket. I'll fly up there. I'll drive up there or something. And he said, well, no, I'm going tomorrow. So I had to figure out work, get a plane ticket, get on a plane that night and fly up there. <laughs> so, of course, they told and us. And that's how things got started, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we got stuck. So we got, I get up there. They say it's a type of camellia bush. It needs high heat, high humidity, acidic soil. And we said, well, that's home. So we kind of thought about it, and by the time we made it back to the house, we decided to go ahead and buy six plants. Um, so we bought six plants off the internet, put them in the ground, said if one of them was alive by the end of the year, we'd go ahead and do it. Um, so six or three of them were still alive by the end of the year, so we decided to jump in and do it. Right now, we have roughly about seven acres in, uh, planted in various stages. Um, this year all we had was roughly maybe about a half an acre that was producing. Um, over the last couple of years, um, all that's been is this front field right here, um, which is roughly about a fifth of an acre. And that's what we've produced on over the last two years. This year we had a little more that came online, so we were able to... The one just behind there, right? Right, the one just behind the nursery area here. Yeah. And here in the nursery area, you have all new young plants, right? Right. All in the nursery area is all new young plants. We made a plant order. We ordered 60,000 plants in the beginning. Wow, um, that's a lot. And Sounds because we needed, we decided 10 acres is where machinery made sense, so we just start with 10 acres. Okay. Yeah, well, that was our thinking anyway. <laughs> so, uh, we uh, luckily for us, the nursery was not able to do all of the cuttings um, because of issues they had of not listening um, to Nigel, so they were only able to get us half of our cuttings. So, we ended up with 30,000 and half of our money back which was okay, we were fine with that when they got here and we realized how many plants we had just ordered. So, <laughs> so now all of those were cuttings. Um, we quick, 
quickly realized that we needed to do seedlings. Um, seedlings were going to work a lot better here for us. Um, so because they're more resilient. Because they're more resilient. So this front field that's up here, which we'll get to um, here in a minute, we're all cuttings as well. And most of the larger field back behind here, over here, were cuttings. So this one up here was mostly gallon pots when it started. So all of them have really good root balls to start off with. And then we had the ones that were in the little quart sized pots that had just started really getting rooting going and everything else. Those are also cuttings or are seeds? Um, half, most, about half of this big larger field up here is cuttings. Okay. Um, and then the rest of it is now seedlings. Do you have any specific cultivar that you use? No. So, as y'all know, mostly from being from Europe, Japan and the United States are really the only ones left that name plants. Mm -hmm. um, and most everywhere else just issues them numbers. So the ones that we have now were issued a number and from that seed lot. So every year when we order seeds, we order that seed lot number. These are uh, not even a year old yet that are in, in the nursery right now. So we start our seedlings in February every year, um, usually around Valentine's Day. These were done, started February 15th. Mm -hmm. So these were grown just this year. And as you can see, they're pretty nice looking little seedlings that have come up, um, which I'll show you as we get on the other side over there where they get started. So but, like a year ago, they were a seed. Right, actually just under a year ago. Just under a year ago, right. Mm -hmm. So, well, they are growing quite fast. Oh yeah. I was, I was thinking they were already a bit older than that. Mm -hmm. Seed plants, as long as they are happy, grow quickly. I see. <laughs> so, as long as you give them what they want and everything else, they will be, they grow very, very fast. Um, so there's no big, uh, here we don't have any big problems with getting them to grow. And what about these uh, covering here? Is this for sun or against air? Right, that is for sun. So when, they're when we first plant them and put them in the nursery, they need protection from the sun. Um, because in the wild, Seeds fall off their plant, off the mother plant, and they are shaded by the mother plant as they get big enough. Um, once they're hardy enough to withstand the sun, they're outgrowing their parent plant. So this shade cloth protects them just like their mother plant does during that time of when they're first starting. Um, and by this time, October-ish, around that time, the shade cloth gets pulled and allows them to start hardening off in the winter. All oh, right. Otherwise, they are usually full-time covered, actually. Right. So this tunnel right here will roughly hold about 35,000 seeds. It never holds that many anymore, but it can. <laughs> so they get put in here one square inch per seed, lined all the way down as far as we go. And then this whole thing gets wrapped in plastic and then shade cloth goes over the top of it as well. Four, not four, seven to nine weeks it takes for the seeds to crack and then to start to germinate. Hmm. About four to six weeks later, they're tall enough to come out of the tunnel and get put into the nursery. This was the first field that was planted, like I was telling you. This is the one that was mostly gallon-sized pots when it got planted. Eight these years plants, ago. About uh, years ago. <laughs> so these were roughly, or are roughly, uh, about six years old now. So in the uh, harvest season, all of this, there's usually new flush on the top of it. It's much lighter green, so you can tell it apart um, and everything. Um, this time of the year, they're dormant. Um, and our harvest season usually runs end of March, beginning of April, all the way through October 31st. So in the beginning, when we first started, it was me and my helper, Amelia, and we hand plucked everything. So just this section right here took us a week to get through. So we started on the very first rows that are over here. And we started on there on Monday and we worked our way through the field. And by, sun by Saturday, we finished this section. And then Monday, we started over again at the front. So six days a week through Hard the work. entire season, we plucked. And that was just plucking. So the whole spring? We, we harvest pretty much the section we harvest it seven days later we can harvest it again mm -hmm. um, so 
all the way from basically beginning of April till October 31st, six days a week. Wow, that's long. So yes. even now, actually, they are still flushing. Right now, they're actually um, not dormant. really flushing. Um, they've all gone dormant late. and everything. So they have little fish leaves on them now. If you look at them, they're little tiny leaves. Um, so it puts that on and that tells it to stop growing. And in the spring, that same leaf will tell that it's warm enough to start growing up again. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see there are some also here. Mm -hmm. And it's nice also some buds and the first leaves are have also kind of reddish color as well. Mm -hmm. The reddish color that you get in plants um, are cam what's called cambod. So Cam Cambodianensis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so cambod short. <laughs> Um, if it has that in its uh, lineage, it comes out and that color on the tips is red. Oh, right. Anyway, in this section, there's six different uh, cultivars in this section that we know of. Um, I can tell you later, actually, where they came from. I can't actually put it out there um, because people get mad at that. So, <laughs> anyways. Um, it's hard to just look across there and see a difference between plants. Um, so it's mostly when you get closer to them, you'll actually start noticing the differences in the color, the way the leaves are shaped and how serrated they are and stuff like that. Um, so there's six different ones here. So as you know, green tea for the most part is two leaves in a bud around the world. Um, so is most of the rest of the teas as well. Um, our black tea, we actually go down one more leaf. So we go to three leaves in a bud. Mm -hmm. And that's because the enzymes for oolongs and the sweeter notes and stuff like that start at that third leaf, and we want to impart that into our black tea. So I we see. go down one more. Leaf. We have more uh, aromatic black tea. Right. So uh, our yellow tea that we um, created also does the same plucking standard as the black. Um, we do not do white teas um, because it is so labor intensive. Um, I was I was wondering why actually. Yeah. So you find white tea more labor intensive than because the yellow of the tea. plucking standard. Ah, the plucking standard. Okay. Yeah. So one leaf in a bud, which is a rough white tea, basically, um, you need roughly around about fifty thousand of those to make a pound, and then just the buds, which is the really fine white teas, it takes a hundred thousand buds to make a pound and there is no way to machine harvest that. So as you can look at these leaves and look at those over there and you know they're completely different. Oh, wow, they're much yes. darker green, they're bigger, their serrations are very visible. Also um, the the rim of the leaves yeah. is much, uh, it's like a few yeah. teeth. Right, they're very, very serrated on the edges. So you can see- so Those are cuttings much, you were saying. These are cuttings as well. And those were those, cuttings also. Ah, it's just different, just a different just cultivar. A different I wonder, actually, I haven't, uh, I've been in many tea fields, but I've never seen such a fragmented, uh, how do you call this in English? Uh, serration. Like serration. a knife that yes. has the teeth. We call it serrated. Serration, okay. Yeah. So, these bushes were released by the USDA. <laughs> um, they are what are called tetraploids. So... Me and you, we took a strand of DNA from our mom, a strand of DNA from our dad to make our set. This plant takes the set of DNA from its mother and the set of DNA from its father. So it has two complete sets of DNA. So it makes for this really, really nice aeration, much thicker, hardier leaves. The stems are thicker, everything else. This is how we plant our bushes. Um, so every hedge has two plants. These two plants are 36 inches apart, 30 inches down the row. And after about three years, these grow together to shade out all of the weeds. Um, so for the first year, three years, for the first three years, we do use an herbicide. And that is strictly right between the row right here. And that's it. And it is hand sprayed. So I come out with the backpack on my back and it's down low. I'm not spraying it all over the plant. So it's just down low. And it's to help me because I'm the one that pushed most. <laughs> so, and this section has to be push mode. So, to help me out for the first three years, we do use an herbicide. After that time, we don't use an herbicide. We never used pesticides at all. And uh, pests and stuff like that, we don't generally have to worry about. 
Wow, um, that, that's here, a big luck. Yeah, here in the United States, because we're not a typical tea growing region, all of the pests and diseases that exist around the world are not here. And we're working on keeping it that way. <laughs> so the other thing that we have here is these trees that you see. These are honey locusts. Um, during the spring, they look like mimosa trees. And which y'all will soon know about if you don't know already about them. <laughs> um, but they make very, they make a mottled shade. So in the lar in this field over here, the first one, as you notice, there's no trees in there. Um, we found out with that section that we needed to slow the plant growth down because during the height of our season, they grow extremely fast. So to give you a, uh, a sense of how fast they grow during that time, you see they're still roughly just over my hip now, and that's because we have the machine. So when we were hand plucking, by the end of the year, we were up here. We were above our heads plucking tea because we couldn't keep up with them. So we needed to slow them down. It's a good for amount of tea. It's bad because in the time that it's growing that quickly, it doesn't have time to send all the nutrients that it needs to the tops. So we need to slow it down. So that's why we put in these trees now. So now that we have seen uh, the fields, we are going to the processing center. And we are going to travel on this uh, tiny car here. Let's go! Dogs, but I don't have one. <laughs> so that <laughs> is Bruno. Bruno, how are you? Bruno is just over four months old now. Oh, only four months. Bruno, be careful. Oh, okay. Don't worry. <laughs> and his name is B R E W N O. Oh. I like you, Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Smells like tea. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that nice smell. You know, I usually travel to China every year to tea plantation, mm -hmm. and of course this year because of COVID, I could not. Mm -hmm. it was such a, such a special feeling mm -hmm. being again on a tea field without having expected that this year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're going this way. So in the beginning, this room was all that existed. Nothing out there existed. It was everything was done in this room. So withering and rolling, which was done by hand at the time, everything was done here. Um, now it is strictly the withering room. So um, green tea, all four teas, no matter which one it is, comes into this room at uh, when it starts. Green tea is the only one that we make that is done in one day. It is also the only one that leaves this room and comes back. So green tea, we start off first thing in the morning and it goes on the bamboo uh, rack that's behind you. And it's here for about four to six hours. We're losing about 20% of its original weight during that time period. Then it leaves this room and goes to the back to get steamed into an ice bath to stop the cooking, into a salad spinner to get rid of excess water, and then back into this room. Then the fan is turned on to allow it to break the water off of it a little bit faster. And it's here for another four to six hours. After that, it's lost roughly about 40% of its original weight. Then it's ready to leave this room and get rolled and dried. Yellow and oolong both require sun withering. We cannot do sun withering outdoors here. So we found out what we needed in the UV spectrum to make that happen. It's actually in the UVB spectrum. So we found light bulbs to match it. And on these two racks that are over here, there's those light bulbs. Those are for that UVB, UVB spectrum that we need. So now, yellow tea and oolong are all sun withered indoors. Oolong is a completely different beast all of its own, <laughs> as y'all very well know. So, oolong will come into this room, go onto those racks. It is there for six hours, just like the yellow tea. During those six hours, every hour, I will come in here, pull every tray off of that rack, fluff them up, Break them back out, stick them back on there. 
after the six hours is over, they come off of there and into here. All this is is a tumbler. Opens up. Dump your tea in. And then you close it back up. Of course, these latches get latched. And then it spins and tumbles the leaves the first time for five minutes. Um, so during the tumbling process, um, as you well know, all we're trying to do is brown the, or bruise the outside rim of the leaves and up the veins and the stem. So this is what this machine is made for. So the first time goes for five minutes. I let it sit there for a few hours. I come back and do it for another five minutes. Let it rest, come back again a few hours later, and it goes for 10 minutes the third time. This is usually 8, 9 o'clock at night. It finishes that final tumble and it just sits there overnight with the lid open. I'll come back usually 9 o'clock the next day. I'll check the weight of it. I'm looking for, once again, a 40% moisture loss. If it's reached that rate, it tumbles one final time for 10 minutes and then it leaves this room and never comes back. So black tea comes out of there, goes into the roller. M multiple batches get rolled, um, of course. So then this gets tightened down. Adds pressure and gets flipped on. So the design of a roller has not changed since it was invented. They've added motors and stuff like that, but the general design of it has not changed. So black tea, um, all that's happening right now is the design on the bottom helps create the type of roll, and it also brings the leaves back into the barrel. So the only other thing that the roller is providing is motion and pressure. Everything else is being done by the leaves themselves. So inside that barrel, they're twisting upon themselves. So after about five, 10 minutes, it's starting to create a ball. So we're gonna turn that off, open it up, pull the ball out of there, put it into a bus tub, break it up, put it back in. So this part takes roughly about an hour with black tea. After this is done, it comes out and goes onto those trays that are right there. They're perforated pans. Those pans come off, they get set right here, they get loaded up, and then it goes into this machine that's right here, which is just a bread proofer. So they have oxidation cabinets or fermentation cabinets in China and places like that. We do a lot of bread and everything here. These exist in the United States. They do the exact same thing. So we have them. So our black tea goes into here. It's there for four hours. Every hour, I will pull the trays out of here spread them back out a little bit better, spritz them with some water, put them back in. After four hours, it's ready to come out of here and it goes into one of these two dryers that are over there. Let's have a look. So these are the two dryers that we have. Um, of course, both from China once again. <laughs> so these right here, they're just like really big dehydrators. That's all they really are. They go up to roughly about 500 degrees our temperature. So yellow. Fahrenheit. Um, hmm? Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit, <laughs> yes. So uh, yellow, green, and black, all three dry at 90 degrees Celsius, which is 197 Fahrenheit. And then oolong dries at uh, 60 Celsius, which is 140 Fahrenheit. So the reason that there's a difference in those is because oolong the floral notes and everything else burn off at 168 Fahrenheit. So we have to keep everything in that process below that threshold. So that's why they dry at a different temperature. Oolong usually takes five to six hours to dry. The rest of them usually take about three hours to dry. And then they're ready to get packaged into big bags and allowed to, be re allowed to rest for about two weeks. We are leaving now the processing area and let's see what is coming up next. Hi, Brio. He's Brio. <laughs> so this is the tea shop. Um, we do have a lot of our teas that are out of stock right now because it's the end of the season and they've sold out for the year. Um, but we'll start again um, come next year and restock everything for next year. So we it's have... Not, it's not a bad thing to be sold out. No, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad thing to be sold out. If we had more tea, we could sell it. We just 
we only made roughly about um, 260 pounds of tea this year. Um, and what we did create last year, green tea didn't sell as well. So we didn't make as much green tea this year and we were out of it first. Everybody had a run on green tea this year. So you never know what the, what the year is going to bring. So you try to prep for it the best way you can. <laughs> and then we also have our two oolongs that we still have left. So our Mississippi Bell oolong and our Mississippi Empress. Um, the Mississippi Bell is made of just those larger leafed ones that have the really good serration on them. That is the Mississippi Bell. And then the Mississippi Empress is made of the other six cultivars that are in that same field. So that's where they're different in their flavors and everything else. We have a- So you said one is a single cultivar and the other mm -hmm. is six cultivars. Right. Okay, I understood it right. Yeah, we for sure buy the two mm -hmm. oolongs yeah, because yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. We are more into pure tea. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, and do you have an online shop as well? We do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you run it personally because I've yes. seen that you have also our distributors, right? Yes, we have two other distri uh, distributors. So there's one in Dallas um, and he distributes all over the United States. Um, we have a few um, shops that actually buy directly wholesale from us. Um, a lot of wholesalers buy directly from the distributor in Dallas. Um, we have another distributor, which is Fortnum and Mason in London. Um, and we're actually next year picking up one in Canada. So nice. Yeah. We'll be, we'll be covered <laughs> pretty much over the entire world. We'll be covered now. So. Over the world. Yeah. <laughs> so Timmy, thank you very much oh, for everything. Welcome. It was really interesting to see all of these and we wish you good luck and maybe we keep in touch. We will hopefully soon open a US branch of our tea business mm -hmm. and it would be great to offer also your tea to our customers. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great holiday and speak to you soon. You too. <laughs> we are back in the tea fields after the tour. It has been really really nice to see how tea is cultivated in the US which are the problems actually that uh, farmers here have to encounter that they don't have in China, for example, even finding the machinery to uh, process the leaves and also the advantages that they have, like the fact that here there is no problem with pests, so there is no need for using pesticides because the tea pests are actually in China and in other places where tea is produced and not here in southern USA. Caroline, which is the part of today that you like the most? Well, it was very interesting in hearing, you know, the details about um, making tea and all the hurdles they had to face and all the trial and error that went with it. So, um, yeah, yeah, and it's, it, it, it really becomes very concrete what all the aspects you need to think about uh, when producing tea. So that, that was really the interesting part. Yeah. And the fact that they are able to share it with us speaking English, so it's much easier to understand them than to understand the Chinese farmers for sure. And actually, we were even able to see the uh, plucking machine that they have been developing. We cannot reveal much about it because it's still kind of top secret, it's a prototype. But what we can tell is that they have been developing together, of course, with another car, larger company, a machine for plucking the leaves that avoids cutting the leaves, that really pluck the leaves like would be hands and this is part of uh, the, the the purpose actually of the um, tea company here in mississippi that they would like to make to reduce the labor cost so that also here in the first world they can produce tea without having to rely on uh, um, hand labor basically I hope you have enjoyed uh, watching this video it has been uh, a little bit of a special one we are really looking forward to buy uh, not to buy, we have already bought them, but to try the two oolong tea that they have been producing. Unfortunately, they have been run out of the black and green tea, but I'm sure there will be more opportunities in the future to try them. Thanks a lot for watching and we will see you in the next video. Bye guys.